so we wouldn't be alone. All of the crying and the hurt came to die and change the world. You changed my world. You turned water into wine. Healed the eyes of the blind. All of the hearts you came to mend. It is your love that never ends. You never end. You are greater than the fire. You are stronger than the wind. You are fed.
Happy Sabbath, and welcome to the GCA Church. Whether this is your first time visiting us or you've been coming here your entire life, we are glad that you decided to worship with us this morning. This coming Monday, week of prayer starts at GCA, and you're welcome to come join us at 7 p.m. every night and on Friday night, 7.30 p.m. Pastor Mark Wittes will be the speaker for this week, and he will conclude this next Saturday. Tuesday night at 6.30 p.m. is this month's elders meeting. All elders are invited, including newly chosen elders yet to be confirmed. This will be a brief meeting, concluding in time to join week of prayer. September 27th is the annual 5K Unity Run. The Georgia Cumberland Conference is one of the sponsors of this race, and the Advent Health is one of the premier sponsors. Our church will be sharing a booth with the Calhoun Church at the finish line. Come be a part of the local community by registering for the 5K or volunteering at the booth to hand out swag and connect with the runners. Contact Pastor David if you have any more questions. Mr. Torzny now has an announcement. All right, welcome church. This group coming up behind me, uh, this is a good Sabbath. This is a Sabbath where you get to see the fruits of your labor uh, when we live out our mission. Because what you see up here, you recognize this person right here. Everyone recognize Lauren? Yeah. And you recognize Chidi. Say hi, Chidi. This is Engage Ministries, and they are back to lead worship with us today. And they have two of our alum. And so if you ever wonder what happens when they leave here, this is a great example of uh, the fact that the mission is being lived out and it's fruitful. And so I'm excited about them. You might recognize a couple of these guys. They've been in a band together for a while. We also have Ben and Mary's grandson here, Ben. Ben. So, so it's kind of like a family band back. Uh, so we're going to let them lead worship and sing with them and support them as they, they live out their ministry. Real quick, before we start with our opening song, I want to bring Rachel up. So as Mark said, Lauren's here back with us. Um, and we just want to take a little bit of time to talk to you, Lauren and Rachel, if you hadn't noticed their sisters, clearly. Um, so first of all, if you girls can tell us a little bit about your family and where you guys are from. So my family is from Kennesaw, Georgia. We live like an hour away. Um, my mom is from the Philippines. And my dad is from New Jersey, so that's my family. And you have a younger sister, too, yes? Yeah, we have a little sister, and she is in eighth grade this year. All right, so we get to see her next year. Um, so have you guys ever been back to the Philippines, and what family do you, do you still have family there in the Philippines? Um, we have been to the Philippines one time, um, right before COVID, and... Um, when my mom finished nursing school over there, she came to the States, and then shortly after, our grandparents came over with her, um, but all of her siblings are still in Manila, so. That's awesome. Okay, so I have had the privilege now of, I mean, Lauren was in Magnify for four years, um, and Rachel joined us this year, and she's also in band, so I've had the privilege of teaching both of you now. Tell us just a little bit about kind of what music means to you and why you have done it and like did you always do music as you were growing up but what kind of place does music have in your life so growing up my mom would always make us like go to piano lessons like every week and we would practice every day and like I always enjoyed piano lessons sometimes but like <laughs> honestly <yeah. laughs> same I was I started piano in kindergarten um, and then when we came, when I came to GCA, I was very excited about the Praise Banner program because GCA would come to our church um, where we live, and so I was so excited. And I think now I really enjoy music because I use it as a form of worship. Um, and before we just did recitals, so I love playing with praise band. So, all right, last question. Um, so tell me, like, obviously you graduated in 2021. Um, and Rachel, you're a sophomore this year. So what's kind of, what do you enjoy most about GCA and what did you enjoy most while you were here? For me, I enjoy, I love the family like community here because everyone is so welcoming and so nice. 
And I'm just really thankful for everyone here. And I also agree with that. I think that it's very important to realize that being at this school, you get to know people around you and you learn so many different like social skills um, and just learned a lot to get to know people and how to talk to them. So, yeah. Awesome. Well, let's have prayer together. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for Lauren and Rachel and just ask a special blessing over their school year and their respective studies and that you would just continue to be with their family, um, lead and guide in their lives, and thank you so much for their talents and how much they use them for you. We love you so much. In your name we pray. Amen. Sabbath. This is Engage Worship, and we are a group from Southern that travels around mostly the Southern Union to academies just like you. Um, and basically why we're here is we just want to give you a little bit of a taste of what the spiritual aspect is at Southern.
right. We, it is time for our children's story, and uh, I am not doing the children's story, but we have a very special children's story for you. So kids, this is time to gather around and bring up the money that parents and people are holding out for you, and we will have a wonderful children's story brought to you by Magnify Worship and Deacon Higginbotham. guys welcome today we have a very special children's story and for all the big kids out there uh, this year magnify worship we started a new uh, line of mission and it's it's a video mission that we're sending out to churches small churches or to youth groups of uh, children's stories and they're stories that are written and animated by two of our very own students the first one is Deacon Higginbotham who's in the back and he animated this he wrote the script he filmed it. It's narrated by Dr. Gerard, our very own Dr. Gerard. Drayson Self is the other student that's working on them, and you'll see them coming out. But we have a wonderful story for you. Today's message is Alive in Christ. And this story is about a boy who let God live in him and the amazing things that he was able to do. So we're going to have you watch this story today. There once was a boy named David. He was the youngest of eight sons of Jesse. He wasn't the strongest of his brothers physically, but his faith in God was stronger than all of his brothers combined. At the time of our story, the Israelite army was in the middle of a battle with the Philistine army. Jesse's three oldest sons were members of the Israelite army and were stationed at the front of the battlefield. David wasn't old enough to join the army. He instead helped his father by watching the sheep. But one day, David ended up at the battlefield because his father told him to take food to his brothers. When David arrived in camp, he dropped off the food and ran to the battle line to find his brothers. That's when he saw the Philistines' secret weapon, a very big secret weapon. Goliath was a Philistine champion who was over nine feet tall. As David was talking to his brothers, Goliath stepped out from the line of Philistines and shouted, choose one man to come and fight me. If he wins, we will be your slaves, but if I win, you will be our slaves. 
The Israelites were terrified. They knew they didn't stand a chance against the giant. David watched as the soldiers cowered in fear. He didn't understand why someone didn't fight Goliath and stop him from saying such mean things about the Israelites and their God. Since no one was doing anything about it, David decided he should stand up to Goliath. So David went to King Saul and said, I want to fight Goliath. King Saul replied, are you crazy? Have you seen the size of Goliath? He could destroy you just by stepping on you. But David told King Saul how God had helped him kill a lion and a bear who had attacked his sheep. David said, the Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and bear will rescue me from the hands of Goliath. So the king said, all right, go ahead. Saul tried to dress David in a coat of armor and put a helmet on his head and give him a sword. David took them off and headed to a nearby stream of water where he picked up five smooth stones and put them in his bag. He took his sling and his staff and headed off to meet Goliath. When Goliath saw David coming up the hill toward him, he laughed and said, this is who you chose to fight me? Am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? Then David said, you may come at me with weapons and armor, but I come against you in the name of the God of Israel, whom you have defied. His power will defeat you today, and everyone in the whole world will know that we serve the only true God. Goliath moved toward David to attack him, but David wasn't afraid because he had God on his side. David took out his sling, and he put one of the stones in it. He started swinging it around really fast, and then he let it go. The stone shot through the air and hit Goliath in the forehead, and he fell face first to the ground. David had won. He had beaten Goliath using only a sling and a stone, but he couldn't have done it without God's help. So remember, kids, God is stronger than anything and everything. Be like David and have faith in God, because faith can defeat giants. Oh, all right. So, guys, living in Jesus, having God be a part of your life, you can accomplish anything in your life. And if you take that away from this story, it's a wonderful day, okay? Let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you for allowing us to be in you. Thank you for being in us and giving us the will and the strength to accomplish anything that you want us to accomplish. Be with these kids as they go through their day, and we love you and we praise you. Amen.
This is where we're meant to be. Me and you and you and me. I don't have to prove a thing. You've already approved of me. This is where we're meant to be.
please kneel with me as far as possible. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, God, that we get to be here today in your house, Lord. Um, God, thank you for the amazing music. Lord, let it fill this place, God. Um, please send your Holy Spirit to be with us um, as we worship you. God, I want to just pray for those who are hurting, who are not feeling it today, um, who may have just things going on in their life. God, I pray that you would uplift them, that you would guide them. Lord, thank you for all that you're doing for us, God. And I just pray as Pastor David speaks that they may be your words, Lord. Uh, please forgive us of our sins, God, and we just want to praise you for all that you've done. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, church. How many uh, pet owners do we have here today? Pet owners? Pet lovers and owners. You love your pets and you own your pets. Okay, good. We've got a lot of us in the house and we can be tracking on the same page. I want to talk a little bit about pet ownership. I have more pets than I actually care to have right now. I, I love them all, but somehow, like, I wanted one pet in my life. That's all I ever wanted. And somehow it keeps growing and adding. And I think we've drawn the line to no more pets, maybe. But I want to go back to our, our dog and how we got our dog. You see, pet ownership is a dangerous endeavor, particularly when you have kids, because you know whenever you bring a pet into the house, it doesn't matter what kind. It could be a gerbil. It could be a fish. It could be a dog or a cat. You're bringing in a lot of emotions, and you know that one day this thing's it's gonna die, right? Like we know it's gonna like the cycle of life. You can hear Elton John singing about this. It's gonna happen. Like it's, it's, things are gonna happen, and one day you're gonna have to mourn the loss of your dog or your cat or your fish, and you're gonna have to have if you have kids to talk with your kids. So a number of years ago, we had a dog, a beloved dog, um, but she was aging. She was rapidly aging. She was blind, 100%. When I say blind, you could wave. She couldn't see a thing. She would run into the wall. It was getting really sad, and the end was becoming notably clear. And so my wife, Valerie, and I, we had this conversation about how this is going to be hard on our kids. They had all grown up with this dog, and we needed to prep for this. And so what's the best way to prep for it? We thought we would get another dog. And, and honestly, we said it was for our kids. I think it was actually for us. Like, we knew that we were going to struggle, and we thought maybe we could kind of alleviate the process a little bit um, if we got another dog that would be a young dog when this other dog passed, which then, of course, starts you with this never-ending cycle. We're never going to not have a pet, I think, going down this road. And so we got ourselves Tucker. Let me show you a picture of when we got Tucker from the very beginning. This is baby Tucker, right? It just like warms your heart. He was so adorable, like a little tiny fluff of white, and he was just really nice. But of course, they're never quite as peaceful and nice as they look. And immediately at this young tender age, the destruction began. And many, many, it's funny to me, every time you buy a dog, how many have gone through the process of shopping for a dog with your own money? Yeah, you get really like concerned about how much you're going to spend on that first dog. And like, oh, well, this is an expensive dog, or this is a better deal. It doesn't matter. They come in and they destroy everything you own anyway, right? And so we bring this dog in, and he's a terror. And we quickly learn something about Tucker that was very different from our other dog and every dog since, which is only the other one so far. He has an appetite like none other. Uh, Academy kids, I told some of you about this uh, midweek, but let me tell you a little bit more about him. He likes to eat. And I remember the first moment this really struck clearly was when he was a little bit older than this. He was an adolescent dog. Actually, we can go on to more pictures because you can see how well he likes to eat. This is him now. He's 80 pounds, and he just keeps on growing. I would like to say it's all muscle, but there's a little bit more than muscle involved because of his dietary habits. And so here's Tucker, and one more picture. He likes to like perch himself where food has been, um, just always ready for the next thing. So 
when he was an adolescent, very early on, first few weeks of having him, Valerie was at work and my kids and I were home alone and I was getting them ready for bed and we have this like upstairs area and this upstairs area where you can kind of look over and see the rest of the house. And we looked down to the dining room table and we had just had dinner and where is Tucker? He's on top of the table. Like, I, I was mortified. He was on top of the table eating up every last thing that we, like he had finished everything on there. Like the entree, a stick of butter, which I've since learned is his favorite thing. And to this day, we have to guard sticks of butter because he'll eat the entire thing in one quick gulp. And this has been like this never ending problem. He's a good dog, but the boy likes to eat. And I try to discipline him. I have these exercises I do with him where he sits in front of his dish. And I tell him to sit and stay. And he sits there and drool just, just like pours out of his mouth. And it feels like this cruel exercise because he wants to eat the food, but I won't let him. And he'll sit there. But the moment I'm not there, the moment nobody's watching him, he has zero self-control. We have another dog. He eats the other dog's food. We have a cat, he eats the cat's food. We have sticks of butter, he eats the sticks of butter. He eats anything and everything with zero control. And the sad part is, every time this happens, every time I have this moment where I'm like, Tucker, you shouldn't be eating this. Tucker, why'd you do this to yourself? Tucker, you're so bad. There's this moment when I'm talking to him that I feel like I'm talking to myself in the mirror. You ever have this? Because there's this moment where I realize as I'm criticizing my dog and his poor self-control, there's so many times in my life where I feel like self-control is not really there. Have you ever struggled with self-control? Tell me someone else here has struggled with self-control. How many dads, parents, have you ever rated your children's candy stash? We've talked about this before. We've talked, yeah, yeah, Mr. Torsney and I, we've bonded over this. Kids Halloween candy, watch out. <laughs> if it's in the cupboard, I'm going to come after it at some point in time. And I have this thing, this strategy. I've talked about how I like Oreos. I'll have there be like a pack of Oreos in the house, and everyone's all gone to bed, and I see the pack of Oreos, and I just look at it, and I think, well, there's all these Oreos, so many of them, just a strip, a strip, a strip. Nobody's going to notice if I take two. You know, have you ever done this? You take out a couple Oreos, and it looks like it's basically the same. Nothing's really changed. And then you say, well, you know, if, if two didn't make much of a dent, then two more is not really going to make much of a dent either. No one's really going to notice if I take two more of these things. I feel like a little boy, even as I'm saying this, like I'm 42 years old, and here I'm having this little argument about how many cookies I can eat. And then it's like you get through a certain amount, and you realize, well, at this point, it's actually going to be cleaner if I just finish up this strip, you know, because if I finish up the strip, then you're not going to see an empty strip. And so you just polish the thing off. And at some point, I've actually justified, you know what, if I just eat the whole thing, I bet I can run out and get another pack because <laughs> I'm a grown man with a car and some cash, and I can bring cookies back into the house and nobody's ever going to notice. And that's just talking about, like, eating. Like, how many of us realize there are things in our lives where we wish we could be a little bit different? Like, you wish you had a little more self-control. You wish you had a little bit more discipline. You wish you were a little bit nicer. You wish you were a little bit this, a little bit of that. And you just, the more you wish that you were, the less you feel you actually are able to do. And um, when we're talking about this relationship, we've, we've been talking about this from the beginning of the year, God and us and our relationship between him. We've been focusing a lot on the God towards us. This idea that, first of all, God loves us no matter what, no, no matter how big the world is, no matter how small our little world is that we live on, God loves us completely, entirely, to an utterly ridiculous amount. We talked about the fact that God simply saves us, that it doesn't matter whether we're good enough or not, because he is good enough for us. And Pastor Josh talked about the thief on the cross, and even in that moment right there, no matter how bad his life was, no matter how dark his choices were, Jesus still saved him. And then last week we talked about this idea that for God, even in spite of the ways that we fail him, he still looks at us and he says, it's worth it, it's worth the sacrifice that I make for you. But the question that I want to think about today is, does it do something now? When we're talking about God and us, the relationship between, does our relationship with God have an impact on our lives today? Or is this just something that we, we're looking for some kind of eternal security? Is a relationship, a saving relationship with Jesus, simply about saying, God, I want to know that when I die, there's something that's going to come after 
God, I want to know that I'm going to go to the good place. God, I want to know that there's like an eternity that's laid out for me. God, is there a safe exit plan for me? Or does it have something to do with our actual present life right now? Does a relationship with God change the present, or is it just something that we wait for the future about? Well, the question is uh, kind of troubling because the reality is as people look out from the outside in, a lot of times it looks like maybe it doesn't really make a difference. I want to read a quote from this, uh, this writer. His name is Morf Morford. And Morf Morford was writing about this on the, the website Red Letter Christians. And he says this, he's, he's talking about how do you identify who Christians are. And he throws back to like the back in the 1990s when we were all wearing witness wear shirts. And you could really identify who Christians were then. Do you guys remember this? Some of you Gen Xers remember the witness wear we all had. It says late 20th century Christians had a phase where they wore buttons or they had bumper stickers on their car or they wore shirts. But now Christians can, not, can be identified not by clothes or acuments, but by, but by, and they fades out. I'm not sure what. Is it ironic or is it just true that American Christians look like American atheists or pagans or car salesmen, or waiters, or teachers, or football fans, or in fact, just about anyone. Is there, should there be, a distinct look of a Christian? Then he goes on to say, you'd think the traditional markers of our faith, humility, compassion, sacrifice, integrity, and generosity would stand out in a culture as avaricious, violent, and dehumanizing as our own, and they would if we actually ever saw them. See, this is the problem that we're looking at when we talk about our faith. When we're talking about God and us is, is does it actually change us? Is there a, a benefit to finding ourselves linking up with God? Does it do something in our lives that we live differently than we would if we didn't have him? Is it noticeable from people on the outside where they say, this looks like a Christian, not because of a cheesy shirt he's wearing, not because of what he told me he's doing on the weekend, but because there's just something different about the way that they live. So with that, I want to turn to our text, which is Ephesians chapter 2, starting with verse 1. I'm going to read quite a bit here, but bear with me for a second. Ephesians chapter 2, starting with verse 1. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. You used to live in sin just like the rest of the world. Everything used to be the same. Obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to, be, used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. But God, pause here for a second, but God, he's, he's noticing this, this transition. This is who you used to be, past tense. But God is so rich in mercy. And he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you were, that you've been saved, for he raised us from dead from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. So God can point to us in all the future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness towards us as shown in all that he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. And then we come down to the core of it. Verse 8, God saved you by his grace when you believed. You can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done so that none of us can boast about it. We've talked about this so much already. It's not about what you do. But verse 10, for we are God's masterpiece. And he has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things that he planned for us so long ago. It's a big passage. And there's so much packed in here. But notice all the things that he says. First of all, he makes it super clear that we have all been in the same boat. It doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter how good your family was or how bad your family was. It doesn't matter where you come from. 
doesn't matter how smart you are or how much you struggle, doesn't matter how naturally religious you are or irreligious you may be, we are all in the same place where we have all struggled with this thing called sin. None of us have not been impacted by us. We all have been in that place. But God, who is rich in his mercy and love for you, did something about this. He saves you, and it has nothing to do with what you're able to offer back to God. Yet at the same time, notice that he saves you for what? For his purposes that he planned from so long ago. For whatever reason, God has this plan for you where he says, you are going to be my workmanship. You are my masterpiece, and I've planned good works to be in your life. I plan to see something good come out of you. Sometimes we don't believe that ourselves. Sometimes we don't feel that ourselves. Maybe this person over here, this person looks like that might be God's masterpiece. Like this person over here, I saw what they did the other day, and they have their lives together. That might be God's masterpiece over there. But this person, like this person that I'm looking in the mirror at, the person that struggles just to like not eat a pack of Oreos, and as inconsequential as that may sound, like is this person really God's masterpiece? Is this the real person that God has? great things in store for. There's something about the way that Paul talks about this, and that's who's writing. Paul, as he writes this, there seems to be this, this idea, this kind of tension that he's walking, where he, he says, this is the story that I claim. In other words, as you look throughout what he writes, you recognize that Paul sees there are problems in our lives, but he still recognizes the sin that used to live in you as a past tense thing. And maybe that's what some of you need to do today, is to, to recognize, you know what, this is something that's been controlling in my life. This is something that's been dominating my life. Maybe that thing that was dominating my life is as current as this morning, but I still claim it as a past tense thing, that this is what God has, has delivered me from. This is what God is in the process of working through in my life. This is who I used to be, but today my identity is different because today I'm in Christ. Today I recognize what he did for me. See, there's this tension in Scripture where it recognizes we all are infected, yet we all have the same hope that has a present-day reality to it. Um, Psalm, Psalm 50, 51, 5 says, Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time that my mother conceived me. This is David talking. He's saying, look, I recognize that this is the existence of the way that I came into the world. Parents, are babies sinful? Do our kids come into the world with a little bit of selfishness? Yes, right? We've said this before. It's a good thing that babies are cute because if they weren't, we would really, really struggle. And we still really struggle. But I mean, like when babies come into the world, there's never like a sense of like otherness. There's never a sense of what can I do for you? Not once during the first year of them living in my house did they ever come up and say, Mom, I woke you up so many times in the night. I'm so sorry. What can I do for you today to make it better? You know, no baby's ever done that. Like babies, all they think about are themselves and taking care of their own needs. They come into the world sinful. This is just who we are. And then Paul, the same one who writes like the past tense idea of who I used to be in, so in, in Romans 7 says this, I've discovered this principle of life that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all my heart, but there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. The power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Thank God the answer is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. So if you find yourself ever struggling with this reality— this idea that on the one hand, God says he's going to do something in my life. On the one hand, God says, I've prepared good works to be done through you. And on the other hand, you feel like you just keep messing up. Know that you're in good company. But at the same time, even as Paul says that in Romans, in Ephesians, he talks about recognizing that God has delivered him from that sin. This is who I used to be, but this is who God calls me now. And even though I might still have struggles over here, God still looks at me through the blood of his son and he sees something different, some kind of potential that's alive and well and growing in me in the present tense. There is something changing in my life. Of course, the other question is, 
do we want something to change in our lives? I think one of the, the issues that we struggle with when we're talking about this idea of, of what it means to be a follower of Jesus, what it means to actually connect with him in this way, one of the struggles that we have to, to go through is sometimes even wanting to know if we want to change. Like, what does it mean to follow Jesus? Like, is it going to make me weird? Is it going to make me do things that I don't want to do? Does God have a plan that's better than mine? Because sometimes when you're going through life, you feel like this is the way that I should go. And you might even have a message that was planted by a parent or a teacher or someone else. And you say, well, ah, I'm not sure if the way that I want to go right here is actually the right way because I know that they said something else. But it just in that moment doesn't seem worth the sacrifice. Like sometimes it just doesn't seem like the way of the cross is the way that makes most sense in your life. Because sometimes it means giving up things. Sometimes it means like saying no to things. Sometimes it means going away that's not exactly where you want to be. So one of the first questions that we just have to simply ask is, do we trust in God? Like, do we trust that his ways may actually make more sense than our own understanding and our own ways? We use that word faith, right? Like we say, in order to have a salvation, like in order to have a saving relationship with God, we need to have faith in him as if it's just some kind of mental ascent saying, okay, I believe God's there. He exists. But the faith is actually put in practice when you say, I believe that your way is better than my way. Is it possible that sometimes the things that we think are going to be better for us are not in fact better for us? You know, it's funny, it wasn't that long ago that we had a different view on a lot of different things in the world around us. Uh, um, medicine would be a good example, right? Uh, y- years ago, they, people would get coughs. This is like in the early 1900s. And they had cough suppressants, much like we do today. And they recognized these cough suppressants were, were effective, and it made people feel kind of better. Um, but then years down the road later, they realized these cough suppressants were based off of heroin. And at some point, someone said, you know what? I'm not sure if it's worth the other health issues involved to get rid of your cough. Maybe we should stop using heroin to treat a cough. Um, similar time frame, uh, there were some ideas about tobacco. Um, not, I mean, of course, you probably know this, that there were some ideas that tobacco had some health benefits. But did you know that there was also the idea that in, in some parts of the world that tobacco was good for your teeth? And they actually produced tobacco toothpaste to make your pearly white shine a little bit better. Then at some point, someone said, no, I don't think that's actually how it works. I don't think this is going to make your teeth any brighter. Uh, Or then there was like dieting methods of the past. Did you know that there was a period of time where people were, well, this is actually marketing. You would find like advertisements for this where you could buy tapeworms in order to deal with weight loss. Because this way you could continue to eat as you please, and the worm inside of you will take care of the excess caloric intake that you're having. And so there's this idea like, well, this makes a lot of sense. So I put a tapeworm in you, and then you can eat and get weight loss, and it's just a beautiful thing. In fact, I hate to admit it, but you can still to this day find places to buy tapeworms for that purpose. But it makes me think like maybe... Maybe there's room for growth. Maybe there's room for progress. Maybe even though we feel like we have arrived at a pinnacle of knowledge sometimes today, is it possible that we're still learning, both like corporately as like a human group, but also individually that we're learning? Is it possible that there's things in your life that you think would be good for you, things that you think you actually want, but in reality, if you were to have some other counsel there, would tell you, no, this isn't actually what you want to do. This isn't really the best for who you want to be. The question is, can we put faith in someone outside of ourselves and say, God, I want this. And then, of course, once you do decide you want God's influence in your life, to be able to submit to that and recognize that there's a journey in how do we live out God's will in what we do. Of course, there's lots of reasons or lots of things to think about as far as what it looks like to live out God's will. Common text that's, that's told often is to think about like what are the things that you're putting into your life. You've probably heard this before. Philippians 4, 8. Now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right, pure and lovely and admirable. Think on these things that are excellent and worthy of praise. 
if we want to be closer in our walk with God, if we want God to be changing us to have good fruit that shows in us, are we thinking about what we consume? And I know that kind of starts to feel like a, a not super fun topic. Like, oh man, are we going to talk about media? Yeah, we're going to talk about media. <laughs> because the thing is, is, like, we're living in a day and age where our consumerism, when it comes to the things that are available to us, is just so incredibly available to us. We spend so much more time bringing things in than we ever have in our past. It's almost like a social experiment that hasn't yet been fully lived out. We don't fully know the results of this yet. I was reading one article from uh, a guy, his name is Emil Steiner, talking about, about binge watching, and this just struck me as humorous. He said, until 2012, the noun binge connoted unhealthy behavior, a period of uncontrollable excess. But the, the vocabulary has changed a little bit because now we talk about binge watching. And how many of us have gone through binge watching before, right? Like I have. And, and it's part of it's the design. It used to be when I was growing up, it was very frustrating. Very fr Gen Xers and beyond, you guys remember these frustrating days, yeah? Like a show comes out and it leaves off and you're like, you want to watch the next show. You had to wait a week. You had to wait a week until the thing came out again to follow up and get your next little thing. Like, it would just all be rolled out so slowly, so painfully slowly. And then if you missed a week, tough luck. You're going to have to catch up the week after. There's a little recap that came at the beginning of each episode so you could kind of know what was happening. But now, so often, these things get dropped all at once. And you start watching the show. You start watching season one. And you tell yourself, I'm just going to watch an episode. But what happens after that episode, the next one gets queued up, and there's this countdown, like five, four, three, and you're like, maybe I should hit pause, two, no, one, ah, and you don't even have to hit a button, the next episode just pops right up, and you find yourself on, like, episode two, gets to the end of that, five, four, I should really hit pause, three, two, oh, I just want to stop it, and then the next one pops up, and before you know it, you're contemplating whether you should go to season two or not. We do this thing called binge watching, and we do it for stress relief. We do it for procrastination. We do it for all kinds of reasons. But the question is, like, what are we bringing in? How much of it is changing who we are? And then, of course, there's social media. I even feel bad saying it because I feel like it's kind of the punching bag right now. But it's true. Like, I was listening to this, uh, this podcast called Land of the Giants, and it's been outlining the rise of Facebook and, and, and kind of like the rise and not quite fall, but maybe fall of Facebook is kind of how it's outlined. And it talks about how Facebook begins uh, in its early days when it's at Harvard. And it's just this kind of little social networking thing and how it develops from one thing to the other. And it's continually trying to garner more of your attention. Um, and I recognize as I say this, and I'm talking about garnering your attention. I'm speaking to a specific audience, and it's not young people anymore. That's what it used to be, right? But as they've um, been growing, they've been learning from the other social media things that have been coming out, and they keep adjusting, trying to look more like them. So as TikTok comes out, they try to be more like TikTok and trying to bring older people along with the younger people in these never-ending scrolling screens that you can look at. But here's what's particularly interesting about all of them. This is from a lady by the name of Dr. Julie Albright in an old Forbes article from two years ago. She says that all platforms, be it TikTok, Instagram, Snapchat, Facebook, they've all adopted the same principles that have made gambling addictive. In psychological terms, it's called random reinforcement. It means sometimes you win, sometimes you lose, and that's how these platforms are designed. They're exactly like a slot machine. What she means by this is that as you're scrolling through your TikTok feed, like sometimes you come across a, a video that's really good and you get a dopamine hit from that, and that dopamine hit says, oh, that felt good to watch, that was something enjoyable, that was entertaining, and so you scroll the next video, which is designed to be a very simple, easy thumb flick, and you're looking for that next dopamine hit and it spaces them out for the ones that are most likely to please you in a way that keeps you searching for that next hit. They're exactly like slot machines, and we don't often talk about how our devices and these platforms and these apps have these same addictive qualities baked right into them. But here's the interesting part, because this feels like maybe we're targeting the high school kids and younger right now. 
But when talking about social media, it's no longer the high schoolers, the teenagers that are the biggest consumers in the world around us. It's the Gen Xers. Oh, the Gen Xers. We don't even talk about Gen X anymore. We're like the forgotten generation. This is uh, in an artic- article from the, uh, uh, from the Atlantic. It says the heaviest users in social media aren't millennials, but Gen Xers. People born between 1965 and 1980 who clock almost seven hours per week on social media. It's an hour more than millennials and Gen Z and whoever knows what's beyond that. The question is, if we want to be different people, if we want to live a different kind of life, if we want to have people be people that are people of good fruit, people that have works living in us, through us, changing us, are we thinking about the things that we bring in? Are we thinking about the way that we utilize our time? Are we thinking about the way that we're being grown? We want to read two more texts. First of all, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 10. This is jumping into the next chapter from Ephesians 2. God says something kind of peculiar. When he's talking about the good stuff that he wants to do through us, he often talks about it in a corporate sense. And he says this in verse 10. God's purpose in all this was to use the church to display his wisdom in its rich variety to all the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was his eternal plan which he carried out through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Strangely enough, God has this plan in us. Like, in us of all people. God says, somehow, the church is who I want to use. When you gather together, when you come together as this body of believers... I have a specific purpose, not just to simply individually make your lives better, but through the kind of fruit that you live out, I want to show something through you. And it's easy to look critically at the church and say, through what? Like, God, God, like, are you serious, God? Like, of all the people you want to use to do something incredible in the world, the church is your choice? Like, how many times has the church failed you in your life? I'm guessing more than a few of us feel like the church has failed us. How many times over the last couple of years, as there's been all the division in the world, has the church been the place of of healing? Has the church been the place that kind of like steps up and steps up their game and acts better than everyone else? It doesn't seem like the church is often being the group that God wants us to be. Pastor Gregory Boyd shares this. He says, just recently, a young man responded to my invitation to faith by telling me, I admit that I feel the need for a savior, but I honestly just can't stand Christians. While he perhaps had not had a well-rounded exposure to Christians, I completely understand where this young man was coming from. Indeed, I've spent much of my professional life answering objections to the Christian faith from the skeptics, and in all the scholarly tomes I've studied, I've never found an argument against the Christian nearly as compelling compelling as this one. Too often, we fall short. Too often, we're our own worst witness. And yet, and yet, somehow, God looks at us and says, I want to use you. Somehow, God looks at this church and he says, I want Calhoun to see something different here. Somehow God looks at this school, GCA, and he says, I want this to be a school that's different than other schools. I want this to be a place of healing. I want this to be a place of hope. I want this to be a place that builds your courage and helps you live out your faith. God looks at the school over here of Coble and he says, I want this to be a place that grows our kids in a different kind of way. God wants these places to be different. Gregory Boyd goes on to say, by definition, therefore, the church is to look like Jesus. By definition, the church is to love like Jesus. By definition, the church is to be corporate, a corporate Jesus. Insofar as any individual or group looks like Jesus, dying on Calvary for those who crucified him, they participate in the kingdom. Insofar as they don't, they are not participating in the kingdom, regardless of how religious they might think themselves to be. This is our calling. If we're to be a church, if we're to be a people of God, it's to be like Jesus, to live lives of love, to live lives of self-sacrifice, willing to put others before ourselves.
And it's when we see this kind of fruit living in us that God's able to use us for the purposes that he's had from the beginning of the creation of the world. This Sunday, there was uh, another mass shooting um, out in Oregon. Maybe you've heard about it. It feels like this is a regular on-repeat story in our nation. Um, But there was a Safeway. I think I have a picture of Safeway in Bend, Oregon, where a troubled young man came and started firing off rounds before he even entered into the store. One victim died out there close to the entrance of the store. And as he went in, immediate chaos ensued. People start running out different doors. Everyone recognized what's happening. People trying to take cover. But there was another man that was in the store, and I'm going to show you his picture. His name is Donald Ray Sorrett. Kind of an unassuming looking man. 66 years old, worker there at that safe way. Um, Seventh-day Adventist, actually. But as you, as, you, as you read through the articles, um, you'll find this guy's name come up. And it's a complicated story because they view him as a hero. Because as the, the gunman walked in, he recognized that he had a chance to leave. He had plenty of time to flee the store, but instead he hid. And he wait, waited for his chance to intervene and try to like, disarm the gunman, and in the process, get shot himself. And, and immediately the store, like the headlines come out that this man probably saved unknown amount of lives. Like who knows how many lives he saved. He was a, a, a vet. Um, a lot of articles are saying maybe this is why he had that instinct. I'd like to think that maybe the instinct came from a self-sacrifice he learned in church. But then there's this debate about what to do with this guy. Because they wanted to memorialize him. They want to put up plaques throughout Bend, Oregon. Somehow say, like, this guy is a national hero. But then it became discovered that this guy has a checkered past. Sins of his past, mistakes, um, things he'd rather have forgotten about, the world, world to forget about. And it feels so reminiscent to all of our lives, this idea that there's two realities we're living out. There's one reality over here that's out of line with God. There's another reality over here that lays down our lives for other people. And I'd like to think that in that moment, the true him shone through. The true him who is willing to say, God, you live in me. God, you gave your life for me. And I can live in a different way or die in a different way because of what you've done. May we answer that calling in our lives in simple ways, small ways, maybe big ways, but may we experience fruit through living out our lives in the way of Jesus. Thank you. 
criminal's cries Darkness rejoices no heaven Then Jesus rose from our freedom in hell When death was arrested my life began Oh your grace so free washes over Let's pray. Father God, thank you for coming to this world to set us free. But may we live in that freedom. May we experience that freedom. May you unloose the things that chain us and hold us in bondage. May we experience a new life through you. And then as we join you, may we join you in your self-sacrificial love and the way that we live so that your works can be present on this earth. In the name of Jesus, we all pray. Amen. Amen.